you've tuned into Invisi Youth Chat Sessions, a video podcast series. Our episode starts right now. Here's your host, Dominique Vale. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Invisi Youth Chat Sessions, where we can check in for your dose of stigma breaking, humor filling, motivation loving life hacks, and empowering tips for all of the medically adultish people in your life. I'm Dominique Vale, founder of Invisi Youth Charity and your host for Invisi Youth Chat Sessions. And today we are at season six, episode 93. And in honor of continuing to bring back our returning special guests from past seasons, it would only be fair that I would get to bring back one of my besties as well and have her on the show, who was also a season one, episode nine guest. It is charity social media manager and social lead at the Children's Society and Disability and Chronic Illness speaker and advocate, Ali Hemsley. With a plethora of experience in the social media world and chronic illness community, Allie has been able to cultivate a voice and community for positive change, starting off with her personal content creation over seven years ago. And as an influencer, Allie has focused on disability, diversity, inclusion, mental health, and motivation, and has shared her journey living with ME and Crohn's disease and even her hip surgery experience. After going back for a Master of Arts in a dissertation of digital media, culture, and society, Allie branched out to take her talents to others. Last spring, she joined the Children's Society, which is a leading UK organization on a mission to create a society built for all children as their social media lead as a digital storytelling producer. Being in charity social media management has really allowed Allie to flourish and bring organic socials that are accessible, engaging, and insightfully driven for all of their content. And outside of work, since our last podcast, Allie has a wonderful dog named Piper, who I love, has gotten married to her husband, James, bought a house, returned to her love of football, and so many other things that we get to catch up on here. So let's jump into the podcast, and I'm going to have you guys hang out with one of my besties. Hey, Ali. Hi, Dominic. I'm so excited to be here today. That was a heck of an intro. Thank you. You are so welcome. This is so fun. Like I said to everyone, this is going to feel like all of our WhatsApp calls, except ours are usually much longer, as we said before. So this will be very fun. And I'm excited for everyone to get to listen or watch. And before we get into our first segment, I like to remind everybody to hit that subscribe button. So if you are watching on YouTube or if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you're listening to podcasts, make sure you have clicked that subscribe button. You have about 55 more minutes to make that decision and hit a click. I will remind you again later. Don't worry. And without further ado, let's go into our first segment, First Few Words. First Few Words. First few words is usually our quick and fun segment where I allow our audience to get to know our special guest even better. So we want our answers from Allie to be her first few words and some quirky, insightful questions that I have. And honestly, this will be fun for me because I, even though Allie and I have been friends for many years, I probably don't know the answers to some of these questions. So this will be very fun. So Allie, are you ready? Yes, let's do it. (laughs) Okay. What would be the perfect date idea for you and James? Oh, going to a football game. Oh, I like that. Oh, who, who are we watching? Chelsea. Okay. Chelsea <laughs> or England or Scotland. Okay. You know, Ooh, okay. Scottish. Ooh, I like we're picking the nationals. I like it. I like it. What is your favorite time of day? Mm, early afternoon, like 2 p.m. Oh, I like that. It's also the time we can talk because of our time difference. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why. Maybe that's why. <laughs> Do you, are you a sweet, savory, or salty, or spicy kind of person? What's your go-to? Oh, that's so tough because I am living like Perry Mayo goes on everything. Um, (laughs) But I have a real big sweet tooth. I'm always eating something sweet. Oh, I like that. Me too. I agree with that. If you were deserted on an island and you had to bring three fun things, I'm not talking about a compass and a phone, three fun things to have with you on the island, what would you want? I definitely got to have a football or I'll be bored. Um, (laughs) Either a Kindle or like a big ton of books. Okay. That counts. Third thing, Piper. She's always good fun. (laughs) Piper would be like, I'll have fun with the books and the football. So I'm going to go. Dream. (laughs) 
I don't think she'd. Uh, I don't think she'd be enjoying a desert island, though. She's no. She probably she's, wouldn't. Uh, she's a bit of a princess. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is one of the first things that you notice when you meet somebody for the first time? Definitely their fashion sense. Oh, ditto. That's that would be my answer as well. And then, oh, speaking of Piper, if she could control one whole day with you and James, what would Piper want to do? Oh, wow. I think she would want to go out for a big run somewhere fun, like the fields or something like that. She doesn't like the beach because she's a wuss and doesn't like water. (laughs) And then probably come home, play with a ball and then flop on the sofa with lots and treats. Oh, it sounds like a fun day for a human as well. It is a good day. It is a good day. I like it. Um, do you have a favorite game or like a board game that you played as a child? Oh, is it bad if I say Twister? I love no, Twister. I love, my sister and I played Twister all the time. That's how we found out that we were so hyper flexible and explains the connective tissue disorder I had that I was always winning. <laughs> Maybe that's why I was so good at it. I was going to say, <laughs> you're like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> um, what is the most unique item that you always have in your bag? Oh, I don't, I'm, I'll be honest, I don't often have a bag because Ooh. I'm a, I'm a pockets gal, but okay. um, my wedding ring was, uh, is actually a family heirloom and it was my great grands and my grands and my mom's and now mine. So that's Aww. pretty unique. Oh, I like that. Oh, that's sweet. If you could join any football team, which one would you want to join? Uh, I see it would have been Chelsea, but they're the women's team, but their managers just left. So I'm gonna have to go for England. Okay. Oh, Be a lioness. Lionesses. I hear I agree. I like that. Um describe yourself in the three words. Ooh. <laughs> 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 That's a big test. Um let's go sporty, silly, and sweet. Oh, I like that. I agree. I agree. I agree with those. Um, If you could switch lives with a fictional character, who would it be? Oh, I think I'd have to go with Alice in Wonderland. Like, she just has amazing adventures. And who doesn't love a tea party? Oh, I do. I agree with that. Even though, you know, some some of the... I'm, I'm such a scaredy cat that some of the characters, if they're, I would have been like, ah, on the whole time, so... I would need to be like your sidekick as Alice in Wonderland because then I'd be like, help me. Um, what is a must-have in your home workspace? Oh, my must-have. It's really uninteresting, but a water bottle that you love that just makes you want to drink water. Like, you Ooh. just I always have to have one beside me. Just stay hydrated. Oh, I do like that, though. I, a water bottle you love, though. I like that you phrased it that way because that is true. I do agree with that. Everyone and has a favorite water bottle, right? They like, do. Yeah, their go-to one. Yeah, I agree with you. And then last question, what is the best piece of advice you've ever given or received? Oh, I technically haven't received it, but I have got a quote on my arm, which is from Shakespeare. It's from Othello. And it's the rob that smiles steals something from the thief. So it's essentially if someone hurts you or they take something from you, if you can find that happiness within yourself, actually, you've taken something from them. And I really like that. That's always stuck with me. Oh, I do. I like that. I do. Oh, and a Shakespeare quote. I'm just, uh, we're, we're ending on like an English literature high over here. Okay, <laughs> let's go for it. Oh, my God. I love that. That was a great ending on that segment, Allie. And go before we go into our next segment, I have to talk about something else that I love besides Shakespeare. It's our Invisive Charity Shop. And you guys know that that is our shop that's exclusively on Etsy. You have seen the bracelets behind me on display. And if you have seen my hand behind my mic, I am wearing a couple as well. They are our subtle activist color block bracelets that are made by our volunteers from the chronic illness and disability community and help run our Etsy store. And they are $4 with free global shipping and 100% of every sale goes directly towards funding all of our free resources and programs that InvisiYouth provides all year long. So you know that you are basically making a donation and getting a gift in return. So if you would love some subtle activism in your life and know that you are going to have a bracelet for yourself or someone you love that will be able to give back, you can check out our Etsy store. Our link is in the description and show notes. It's also on the screen right next to me. So you can make sure to check out InvisiYouth Charity Shop and you know us with our subtle activism. It is 
that Starbucks cup in the Game of Thrones scene. It is, as I've learned recently, the missing hair clip in season three of Bridgerton that seems to pop out in episode one, but magically pop back in later on Penelope. So we want to make sure it's something that sparks a conversation and gets that curiosity going. So if you can check out Invisive Charity Shop, we would thoroughly appreciate it. And now we are going into our next segment with Ali. What's in your toolkit? What's in your toolkit? What's in your toolkit? Mm. What's in your toolkit? You know, at InvisiYouth, we love a good tip sheet and a guide sheet, and we love to figure out what has made life easier, what has worked in making it adaptive and accessible for some success and joy. So we know a big part also about all of your lives is the digital space and how many of us use it for professions, friendship, and sharing about our lives. So with Ali, we are going to chat about how to create that success and toolkit in our digital lives. So I know a big thing, obviously, is social media playing a big role in everyone's life. And it also plays a big role in many people creating friendships and meeting people. Obviously, that's how you and I met as well. So how do you feel the digital space can be used to help cultivate friendships, but also still remain authentic and safe in mending and creating those friendships? Because it's not sort of the way you're taught as a kid to meet people and make friends. Yeah, I think growing up, we we have that perception, don't we? We've got, you know, don't speak to anyone on the internet. And now we're all doing it, (laughs) I say, almost 24-7. I think the brilliant thing about it is that we all live in these little bubbles. And I think especially when you've got chronic illness or a disability, your world gets so much smaller. It can be really isolating and it's hard to maintain friendships. So being able to do it a little bit more accessibly is always great. But then there's also ways that you can connect with the community, either by following the same pages, by using hashtags, by joining groups. I'm a member of the Crohn's and Colitis UK Facebook group, and it is incredible. And from there, I get so much advice and just support. And also people just share funny memes, which I love. I think, like you said, we became friends online and we've managed to maintain that friendship. I think it can start quite naturally going through, you know, a couple likes, couple messages, and then evolve into something more. We're now in a position where, you know, we video call every month or two. (laughs) And we have actually met as well now, finally. (laughs) (laughs) So I think I think it's a really great space. I think my suggestion would be find your people. Mm. That's that's the biggest thing you can do is just find your tribe look for people who have the same interests as you. You don't have to purely make friends with people in the exact same position, the same chronic illness, but you can connect with people who love, like you say, Bridgerton or loves other things that you love. You know, there's some great sports groups out there. There's there's a lot. There's a lot of people that you can meet. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And I think that's a big, um, that's a big thing. Like you said, it's sort of, you have to somewhat use social media as if the way you would think of using a dating app, you're kind of vetting people, you're looking at them, you're seeing what they're like, but then also knowing that you can kind of take a step back if you're like, oh, this is probably not the right friendship or we're not bonding in a similar way. And also knowing, like you said, you can find friendships in different facets. I think especially with the illness space, you're kind of always told to connect with people who have the same diagnosis as you, but then oftentimes even for my case as well, most of my friends that I had the most similar health experiences with actually didn't have the same diagnoses as I did. But just the way that we went about our health journey and our other common interests were what made us be friends. So and we could just then relate on just sort of the overarching of having an illness or disability. So like you said, too, is kind of stepping out of what you might think of, oh, I want people who understand my exact journey and then just who might actually understand me. And then, you know, like being safe about the whole thing of keeping people around and knowing how to like, like you said, in that digital arm of getting to know people differently, I think, like you said, is helpful because you can find people in different pockets. And then the more time you spend talking to them, like you said, we went from just commenting to each other to then messaging each other. And then we're like, oh, well, then let's now text each other. And then that went to, okay, let's talk on the phone and then video call. And then 
like you said, that I got to we got to meet in person when you came to New York. So um, yeah, so then that kind of it brings it full circle. And it, uh, it is like, it's weird. Like you even said, when we met the first time, I was like, I hope I hope Allie and I are, are like, we can like each other in real like without a screen, because it's been so many years, our friendship. So it was and then it was ironic. So I was like, Oh, you and I are both like, we're in similar height distribution. So that <laughs> feels good. Because um, I always worry when people meet me in person, I'm going to be so short. But we were, we were good. So um Yeah. So I think, like you said, that is, that's really important. And then also sharing about, like you said, things that you enjoy. And I know something you also enjoy is your football that you have gotten to have. That was something, a part of your life prior to you having your injury when you were younger and developing ME and then now into your adult life. So, and I know that's something so many people think of when they're going through having a chronic illness is losing different activities or sports they were involved in. So for, how has that been for you to kind of have to put a halt on playing football at one part of your life and then f- realizing, oh, I want to try to get back into it, but still be mindful of my health and where my limits were? Yeah, I think it was such a journey. You know, having to give that up at like 17 it was it was so upsetting it's something that I'd loved all through my childhood and it was just getting into that stage where I look back at it now and I probably would have been about to join you know a ladies team and create this new community and like I said my world got very small and there just wasn't enough energy for no quote-unquote normal daily tasks let alone exercise football things like that so it actually took me seven years to get back to football. So I spent seven years without it. And then when I talk about getting back into football, it's not like it happened really easily. It actually took me three attempts to do it. And they were spaced out over time, you know, each time a few years apart. Mm. And I tried it and I, it took me just that time because I think I wasn't ready the other times. It wasn't sustainable. I thought, okay, I can maybe do this, but I was pushing myself too early. And I very quickly realized that. And I think there's a big thing about listening to your body And Mm. having that acceptance that it's okay if I have to put this on hold, it's okay if I have to, you know, leave this for now, I can still enjoy it in other ways, like through watching games. I found for a little while, I found that hard, because it was frustrating, and I wanted to be part of it. And I felt like I wasn't. Um, But then there's been other times throughout that journey where I really enjoyed watching football and connecting with the community. Yeah. And then when I did get back to it, it was just incredible, because it's opened my world up it's given me great new friendships it's really built my confidence and that trust within myself as well that I made the right choices I listened to my body when I needed to and now I get this reward Mm. yeah no that is really true because like you said I like how you said it was so much also of listening to your body and that you had multiple attempts you didn't the one time it didn't go well you didn't just say okay I'm never gonna try this again you went and tried it another time and another time to see and adapting it to fit to your body I think is very important because you can enjoy the same activity but not have to play it at the same level you were prior Um, or always that comparison game I think a lot of young people will worry about what what if I'm not as good as I used to be or my body isn't going to be able to do what I know it used to be able to do And once you start going down that obvious rabbit hole, it can then just sort of suck the joy out of the sport or doing the activity you were doing. So I think, like you said, being mindful of finding new, remind the things that were nostalgic that you do enjoy, but then also still reminding yourself of things that you can enjoy now that are like a different focus for you too. Yeah, definitely. And I think as well, it's, you know, I don't want to preach about gratitude because I think it can get overplayed within um, within the chronic illness community. And I think mm. it can be hard sometimes. We get a bit of, you know, toxic positivity. But for me, when I was able to start exercising again, so I couldn't exercise for, I think, six years. I think maybe football took me eight rather than seven. Yeah. So a long, you know, big period of time. And that was a time where, in theory, I was probably at my peak as an athlete. But obviously I wasn't because I was lying on the sofa for 20 (laughs) hours a day. Um, But so when I finally did get back, I had this real attitude of everything is incredible. Everything is it's not a chore. I'm not exercising to be skinny or because I feel I should or, you know, any of these societal pressures that we have on ourselves. I was exercising because it felt great. 
and because I wanted to. And I had that real gratitude about it. And I think that's really important as well. You know, when you have got back to it, it can feel frustrating that you can't do everything, but have that gratitude for what you can do because it makes such a difference. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I like how you said too, it's it's uh, being mindful of your of the not trying to just be like grateful for everything and grateful for every because you're always so ingrained to be like, oh, well, just just be <laughs> happy with what you can do or just be okay with what you can do. But it's being mindful of when there is that little win, actually allowing yourself to celebrate the little win to enjoy the little things that you're doing, um, I think is really important for people to notice. And then even because I know you had shared about getting back into football on your social media platform and something else you shared on your platform was when you had gotten diagnosed with Crohn's um, later in your life as well. And so much of your community that had you had built through your platform had known you from ME and being a part of that community. So, and I know so many other young people either get re-diagnosed later in life or they end up getting a new diagnosis and they feel like they're even just outside of social media, their network of people only know them for the one thing. And so for you, what would, how is that decision like of, I want to share about having Crohn's now, or how were you thinking of if there were any worries of, or how is my community I've built here going to feel now that this is a whole other sector of the chronic illness space? Yeah, I think that's that's a great question. For me, I certainly had some reservations about sharing it. I think where my journey had got to at that point is that I was exercising again and things like that. And so there had been questions from people of, well, are you sure you had ME? Do you still have it? Things like that. So I always had this niggle in the back of my mind. And throughout my whole journey, I always felt that there was something more, but I couldn't get the answers that I needed. So mm. I just had to accept the diagnosis that I had, which I did. But when I was then, you know, diagnosed with Crohn's, I realized, okay, this has been affecting me this whole time and more. And it it kind of shook my world a bit because it made me question everything else. I was like, okay, well, does my ME diagnosis still stand? Was that a misdiagnosis? Was that the right diagnosis? Have I recovered from that? Am I cured? It just brought up so many questions. And I think I really had to own that within myself before I started sharing it. I had to understand exactly what this new diagnosis meant for me, what that meant for my history. And I also had to accept that I wasn't going to have all the answers. Yeah, You know, I think especially when you're talking about ME, which you can't test for necessarily, it's not like the doctors could go, yep, you had this from this time to this time. We've got it on the grass. Here's the evidence. (laughs) You can't do that. So I just had to accept, okay, this is now my diagnosis. I spoke with my doctors, they said, actually, we think you did have ME, probably flared up because of your Crohn's. And then Mm -hmm. we just never caught that. We think you probably have recovered from that now. Now your symptoms are just Crohn's. So I was like, great. Okay, cool. And then I had to adjust myself to a whole new community. Because it's very different. I think, you know, chronic illness, we all have this level of understanding. But you have these little niches as well within the communities and what's good for you, what's not good for you. For example, like exercise might be really good for one illness, might be awful for another one. Diet really varies. For me, I think diet was the biggest thing that I had to wrap my head around because everything that you think is a healthy diet, (laughs) you're told to avoid with Crohn's. You're like, no, limit your vegetables, limit your fiber, eat white bread, (laughs) like eat white pasta. And So I think I took a little bit of time when I got that diagnosis just to make sure I understood it. I understood what it meant for me before sharing it with everyone else. Yeah, I did share it quite early on just because I felt like that was the right thing to do. I needed to talk about it and I needed people also to see me where I was at, you know, Mm. say, I don't have all the answers at the minute. This is the answer I've got. Like it or lump it. (laughs) No, but I love how you phrase that too, because it's kind of like a, what we'll say is like a zoom in, zoom out approach, um, where you have to kind of zoom in on just you and you digesting the information. How do you feel about it mentally, physically, so that you have a kind of a semblance of stability for yourself before you then zoom out and go, okay, how can I maybe share this with my friends, with my 
network of people on social media or with my the people I work with and coworkers. And so if you felt that semblance of, okay, I've kind of worked through the the panic or uncertainty portion now, and then now I can maybe answer some people's questions or actually feel confident when I say I don't know. And I think that's always the big thing is when you feel uncertain, when you don't know something, especially when it's your health, people think you just are like the walking WebMD of your of your diagnosis for your body, and you should know every answer. Um, but most of the time, we're not given all the answers, so we are left in a limbo when it comes to a lot of our health issues. So to feel a confidence being like, this is all I know right now, um, and I'm still figuring things out, and feeling that confidence in it, I think is helpful um, for other people trying to gauge, not feeling like they have to hide certain portions or feeling like, you know, I just am not ready and it's not my time to share because it is always that back and forth of, of what do I talk about? What don't I talk about? Yeah, absolutely. And I think as well, remembering that it's your health. It's mm. as much as we want to share it and it's great to share it, to ne- connect with that community. It's really no one else's business. You can put those boundaries in place and go, this is what I'm willing to share. Here's where my hard line is. We don't go past that. Yeah. Like, I no. think that's perfectly fine. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think like you said, that's a really good point is like, and to end on that too, is like making, knowing in your head where those boundaries are of what you're going to talk about. Like I always say, I have my, my box of where I'm comfortable sharing about my diagnoses. And then once I hit that, it's going past that box. I just don't, we, we know, and I know how to tell people, you know, like that's a little too personal for me, or I don't usually talk about that portion. And most people, especially those who are a part of your network will be like, oh, got it okay and then just start asking about other things and so the right people like you said will hear your comfortability and then respect it so I think that's a good a good point to end not only this segment but also end the first half of the podcast um because we're about to guys hold on I know you want me to jump into segment three I know you want to go into the intermission but before I do that with Allie I have to thank all of you guys for watching or listening to the InvisiYouth chat sessions. It is our first digital resource we have at InvisiYouth, and that's because of so many wonderful donations from people like yourselves and your support networks who will donate to InvisiYouth um, all year long. It really helps us keep our lights on, keep all of our programs and resources free all year long for these wonderful teens and young adults living with chronic illness and disability in the numerous countries of young people we have downloading and utilizing our resources every single month so that they can thrive in the non-medical aspects of their life with a health struggle. So we always have our donate link. It's been on the screen as I've been talking and it's in our description and show notes because 100% of every donation that comes into InvisiYouth goes directly towards funding our free resources and programs for these incredibly deserving young people. So if you're able to donate any amount, that is wonderful. If you have family or friends who could donate on your behalf in support of our nonprofit. We thoroughly appreciate it so much. And so thank you guys, as always, for being a part of the Invisiv chat sessions and our nonprofit organization. And now we will go into everyone's favorite segment, my favorite segment. It is So That One Time. So That One Time. Guys, so that one time, you know, is when I get to take a break, sit, drink my coffee and let our guests tell us a story. And I'm excited because I know so many life stories from Allie. So I'm going to I'm excited to have a whole new one. So Allie, the mic is yours and take it away. Thank you so much. I actually think I'm. you will know this story. Oh, no. but <laughs> I feel like it is a, such an important one and such a good one to share. So I wanted to take the time to dedicate it to this. So during the pandemic um, in 2020, that's right, mm-hmm. yeah, 2020, I um, was working for a oral care company. So I, it was my first foray into employment after many years of self-employment. I was so excited and I had been in the office for a grand total of two days when <laughs> when things started heating up and uh, we were all told to stay at home and look after ourselves. So it was meant to be sort of part-time in the office, part-time remote, and it suddenly went to full-time remote, which I'll be honest, was great for me as someone with a chronic illness. I was like, this is not the dream, obviously, but you know, 
it worked well work-wise. Throughout the pandemic, unfortunately, things did not stay so well. Uh, things weren't so good. And I was feeling throughout the sort of summer months, a lot of pressure to return to the workplace, even though it was against government advice. It wasn't safe. I didn't even have an office at this new workplace. It was going to be sitting on a picnic bench in, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which wasn't great during a hip diagnosis as well, but sitting oh, wow. on a picnic bench in the break room for a manufacturing plant. So when it was lunchtime, there was going to be, you know, 10 other people in this room. It was, yeah, it was wild. And I was getting a lot of this pressure and I really started to feel anxious about it. Mm. It was a very difficult time. And this built up over a few months. And it got to the point that my manager, who was the CEO of the company, he rang me one day and essentially said, come back into the office or I'm going to make you redundant. And that was, it was a real hard hitting moment. That was the week that I was buying my house. So it was a big time financially, you know, big commitment. Um, And that conversation, it really scared me. And it was, it was really horrible. And you know, he was aware of my conditions. He was aware that I was also going through a hip diagnosis at the time. So I was having hospital appointments that I would have to isolate for. Mm. They they didn't care, unfortunately. So it ended up going to employment tribunal. Now, this took many, many months. And I decided for some reason, mainly financially, that I would represent myself. So for the, the best part of maybe a year, maybe more than that, probably, I was, you know, reading up about employment law, trying to work out how I could represent myself. What did I need to know? How do I write a witness statement, all these things. And the day that I got to the tribunal was, it was such a moving day, I just had this incredible sense of relief, of panic, of excitement, of anxiety, all these feelings bottled up. But it was incredible. And I won. Um, I won my case. Um, so I won um, as a self re- self-representing and um, I won disability discrimination. So it's indirect disability discrimination. So it's technically dis- discrimination arising from disability. Mm. Um, so basically they found that because of my disability, I was put at a disadvantage and I wasn't actually made redundant. It wasn't part of an actual redundancy. I'd lost my job because of my disability. Horrible. But on an almost hilarious note, it was International Women's Day. And oh, right. <laughs> I do remember this. Yeah. And the company that I had taken to Employment Tribunal, they posted on that day a picture of all their female staff members with the caption, you know, happy and happy International Women's Day. We're committed to making a world free from discrimination and bias. And I really enjoyed screenshotting that and sharing that with my LinkedIn. Um, that the day that they shared this was also the day that they lost an employment tribunal for disability discrimination. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, had to share that one. Oh my gosh, I do. I remember that. Yeah, no, I remember the International Women's Day portion. I was like, I remember the whole story, but I remember I was like, oh, right, it was that day. But I like, I like, I love how you said that it was um, how proud you were to not only represent yourself, but to really, it allowed you and this was before you even went for your master's too, but it allowed you to really see um, where there is there is a lot of opportunity for people with an illness or disability to have access to resources and accessibility that even sometimes a lot of employers don't even know about that they can and they just worry about what they know but there is so much set there to protect people and sometimes there isn't but a lot of times just knowing like you said knowing where your rights were and knowing what wasn't a tangible or realistic situation for you and your health and even pull out the chronic illness side of it. Like you said, if you were just having plain old hip surgeries too, like you would have had to have isolated anyway for those and then compounded your health issues on top of that. So um, I think it's really, like you said, it's an important story for people to hear too, knowing that they can they can not only bounce back from situations like that with the different employers, but also 
learn about all the different rights that they do have that they can then share with their employers um, to make other people more informed and then probably make them more comfortable to be more adaptive and accessible to all of their employees too. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's that thing of, I think particularly when you've got like a chronic illness or a disability, you spend you, you spend a lot of years having a bit of self-doubt. Hmm. I think there can be a lot of questions and a lot of oh, ableist questions, but it's like, oh, are you sure? Oh, you're just tired. You know, we get questioned all the time and we always have this little niggle at the back of our heads that goes, yeah. is this real? Is what I'm experiencing right? Is what I think right in this situation? And when I was going through this, I was going, I don't think this is right. I don't think this is what the law says. And to have that validation of, you know, this is, I'm not a lawyer, but I've taken it to tribunal and I've had this validation that no, what what I thought or what I knew was happening, that is the case. That was what was happening. It was unlawful. It was discrimination. And just afterwards, it gave me a real self-belief you know, I think it can be a big thing to stand up for yourself. And it can be really nerve wracking when you it's a situation that you don't really know that well, you know, I didn't know a lot about employment law. But to stand up for yourself and get that confidence, it is just such a beautiful moment. And I've really taken that forward as well. And everything that I do now, I think being a challenger, someone that's willing to challenge people's views and challenge perceptions, and also stand up for what's right. Um, I think it's a really good trait to have. Yeah, no, I love that. And it actually transitions well into what we will be talking about in our final segment with Allie. So I want to make sure we jump right into that. We're going to go into what's your life playlist? What's your life playlist? What's your life playlist? What's your life playlist? We are going to take a new spin on an OG segment. I actually think we did this segment with Allie all the way back in season one, but we are now going to take a new spin on it and talking about living with chronic illness and disability and how you can adapt and thrive in your careers and evolve in your careers while doing that. So we know Allie has had an amazing evolution in her careers and taking different directions. So I'm thrilled to get to talk to her about how that balance has come up, how she's made those different decisions for herself and how other young people can build those steps of a playlist for themselves on how to do that too in their careers. So I know like you had even mentioned too, when we first met, you were doing personal social media content creation. Uh, I'll put in the air quotes, influencer, if you will. Um, And that was your full-time job. And now that's evolved from then you splitting your time between another job and doing it to now leaning more towards bringing your social media skills to others and working with the Children's Society as well. So was there a reason you wanted to start making that shift away from you fully having self-employment or... And then when you were making that decision, how did you take that step and feel confident when you were making that choice? Yeah. So I think for me, the first reason why I entered into employment, which was still alongside self-employment, was, and I'll be honest, that I needed to get a mortgage. (laughs) And it's much easier to get a mortgage with employment than it is self-employment. Let's put that out there. I love that. I love being honest. You're like, I need a mortgage. (laughs) I needed a mortgage. Yeah, it's it's a really weird situation that self-employment, you've got to show, I think, about three years of history and then they average your income, whereas mm. employment, they um, they just look at like three months of payslips. So it's a huge difference there. Oh, yeah. So I thought to myself, well, it's going to be much easier if I just get a job. Um, so I did that for a little bit. But also there was a few other reasons. I think a big one is the stability of it Mm. self-employment can be great and you have that flexibility and you have that balance but you don't have a set income a month unless you're working on some sort of retainer or with clients that are regular clients you don't know what your income is going to be and that can require then a lot of additional planning a lot of stress there's a lot of chasing invoices that haven't been paid so I was finding that although I had in theory this extra time and this flexibility actually I was spending so much of it chasing people for invoices Mm. or worrying about have I got enough money this month when are they when when is this going to get paid I need to move money around out my savings I I don't think I was really feeling the benefits of it so Mm. I thought I need a little bit more stability especially when getting a mortgage buying a house (laughs) and I just also wanted to you know get out my shell a little bit meet some new people 
and try something new. So I think that was my first step into it. And then as time has sort of gone on, I realised after what happened with the employment tribunal, I realised that I don't want to work in the private sector. I want to do something that feels really meaningful. So Mm. that's when I started working in the charity sector. And I've just loved it so much that I've naturally stepped away from the like quote unquote influencer work just because I've only got limited time, I've got limited energy and I'm prioritising that work because mm. it gives me that fulfilment that maybe I wasn't getting as I was starting to get a little bit older. Yeah, no, I like how you said that too. I mean, like a honest answer, but also I like how you said too that it was the um, having so much flexibility sometimes doesn't breed a lot of stability because usually when you are doing that, like you said, self-employment, it you're you're the one that's in charge of building that stability and having all of that. So I think that's important for people to gauge. Like sometimes obviously finances help and that stability financially helps, but then also having so much of that flexibility meant you were spending so much of that free time trying to build all of that stability. Um, Because I think that's a lot of people, especially in the chronic illness and disability space, you're like ingrained to go into self-employment or be an entrepreneur and do sort of that freelancing work because it can bring the benefits to your health and give you that flexibility with having an illness or disability. So did you feel that there were like pros and cons to the time when you were doing self-employment or what were they kind of for you that you even now doing work for in the charity sector that you're like oh I remember I miss being able to like do this or do that yeah absolutely I definitely think that being in charge of your own day is always going to be such a pro like it's great I could absolutely like wake up and go oh I can I feel tired I feel rubbish I'm going to sleep in I didn't have that structure and I think that can be a real positive but it can also be difficult. Mm. And I I realised as time goes on that I tend to work better with a bit of structure. I need those kind of boundaries put in place to help me get along because physically I was probably a bit more well rested, but mentally I really struggled with self-employment as time went on. It could it can be quite isolating. And um I think not having that structure in place can be quite difficult because you can almost lean into it too much lean into that flexibility too much Mm. and also where the work's a bit more up and down although you're like yeah I've got control of my own week I can only work you know five hours a week if I want to when that work comes in when an opportunity is presented to you you want to take it so you then might end up working you know 20 30 40 hours in one week And then none the next week because there's nothing that's come in. And it can feel like you need to grab these opportunities really quickly, Mm. which can be exciting. It can be fun. It's, you know, I enjoy that fast paced side. But for your health, it's not so good because you can't put that planning in place as much. True. Yeah. So I I think there's real, there's both positives and negatives um, to self-employment. I really enjoyed it. And I think it taught me a lot. I think it taught me a lot about people skills, about management you get to wear so many hats when you're self-employed. Yeah. You get such great experience. But now looking back at it, like I feel my career has developed to a place that I'm really enjoying the structure. I'm enjoying that little bit of hierarchy. I'm enjoying having colleagues and, you know, people that I see on Teams calls all day, every day. It works really well for me now. It wouldn't have worked for me five years ago. And I think that's okay you know, if you do self-employment, you don't have to do it forever. If you go into employment, you don't have to do that forever. I think we can sometimes get so in our own heads of, oh, well, this is the thing that I'm being told I must do, or this is the path I've gone down. I can't change from it because what will people think? What will people say? It doesn't matter. Life's short. Do what works for you in that moment. Yeah. And I like how you said too, that if you had, if you hadn't done so, if you hadn't been self-employed first, like if you had done it in reverse, that wouldn't have worked for you. Like even health wise or just personality wise, being in charge of your own work and your own schedule that taught you a lot and was helpful during that arc of your, of your health and of yourself growing, that it then put you in a position to then feel confident making that choice. And I think like, that's a big thing too, is people, once you notice 
somewhat it's like half of it feeling like there's a level of burnout but then also half of it being like am i am i truly being fulfilled or is it because i i know how to work in this structure because i'm doing this is the same kind of the hamster wheel i know how this works i know how to adapt to this for my health i know how to do these things but um being able to and also like you said on the flip side if you go and then work for someone else you could always it's easier to then go backwards and then work for yourself again um because you've done that before so i think people knowing that you can like you said make those changes you can try something see it if it works or doesn't and then go to work for someone else split your time 50 50 you can you can kind of make those small steps. Like you said, you were initially going, let me split my time 50-50 and still do some personal content creation and then work part-time somewhere else. And then kind of evolving that into getting involved, like you said, in the charity sector and that level of fulfillment you felt still doing the same kind of work you were doing for yourself, but now for another person and for another cause kind of made you be like, oh, I'm still, I'm now I'm getting that fulfillment elsewhere. So let me kind of shift gears. And I think like you said, that's helpful for people to know evolving your career is something that a lot of people do and you're never too old to do it or too young to do it. Um, So just doing what you feel is going to be a good mesh for you physically and health wise, but then also personally and what you would like to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as well, it's like we said, learning about what options are out there. Like in the UK, flexible working is now a day one right. So Mm. you can put in those flexible working requests as soon as you start, which is brilliant. There's a lot more remote working, you know, there's part time hours. So even within my full time role now, although I don't actually make use of it most of the time, I have I technically have flexible working as part of my adjustments. So if I woke up and I was having a really bad day, I could shift my hours. I could just start a little bit later and either finish later or pick those hours up unless I just wanted to take a sick day. You know, that's also the benefits of employment. You get sick days, you get support with your pension, you get, you know, Mm -hmm. all of these things. You've got a support team around you. And I think sometimes, particularly when you've got a chronic illness, you forget that you're allowed to also be sick and you're allowed to just, you know, take (laughs) a day. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know you. That's you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me out. No, okay. <laughs> you know, and I think having that support system around you and leaning on that and knowing when you can lean on that is really important. You know, people want to see you succeed in employment. You know, your colleagues want to see you succeed. HR want to see you succeed. And you can really work with them to establish the best way of working for you. And that gets the best out of you for them. Yeah, I think that's true. Like you said, too, is is that by people being, especially from an em- employers or coworkers, there can be a lot of in, like worry of, oh, I've never had a coworker that has a chronic illness or disability, and they then don't know how to handle that. But then you being able to say, like, I'm still the same quality of work is getting done. It's just my route to get to the same endpoint isn't going to be the same as yours, but it's still getting done. It's still being done timely. And people realizing, wow, okay, oh, wow. And then that might make some other people feel that they can get a little creative to work around what they might be going through in order for them to be successful. Because I think that even was going to go into the last thing I was going to ask you too was, I think, how has for you kind of a two-parter, how has evolving your career into doing social media for the charity sector, how has that brought more joy or fulfillment into your life? And then how do you still find that same kind of, like you said, that fast pace or fun excitement part of being the social media creator and being self-employed in influence work? How do you kind of still get that level of excitement, but now not doing it? Yeah, yeah, completely. So I think, and it kind of answers both parts at the same time. For me, what I love I love creativity but I am also I just love learning so Mm. I really enjoy learning about something new and I think entering into the charity space that was a whole sector that I didn't really know about and there are so many then parts to consider even when we're just talking about social media so many parts that go into it which you need to think about so you know you've got your branding so how does the branding work for this social media how does the brand's tone of voice enter this social media? You know, how do we frame it in the right way? Like the way that we'll frame um, 
poverty is different from the way that we would frame uh, exploitation. How do we do that? How do we change people's minds? You know, the Instagram content that I was doing, I loved doing it. And I did a lot about disability and raising awareness. But also I did some campaigns that were just, you know, fun fashion things or, you know, doing my new favorite washing powder. They're great, but I'm not changing people's minds in the same way. I'm not having that bigger picture impact. Mm. So I love that I've got this potential to change thousands of children's lives. Like that is huge there was one point um last year where they were debating the uh illegal migration bill so the like refugee bill in the house of lords and some copy that i had written actually was used there and i'm like words that myself and someone else in my team had worked on are being used in parliament to debate a law that is going to change hundreds of thousands of people's lives like you can't get bigger picture than that and that just makes me so excited like you can see it now like I'm so enthused by it so I think even though that there's things you might enjoy about you know self-employment or one part of your work there's so much more out there which you don't even know about yet like I was never expecting that I didn't think that would be something I was super interested in but now Mm. I'm like there's me listening to politics podcasts every day because (laughs) I want to you know I want to learn more and get more into that side of things as well so I think Although I still get that bit of enjoyment out of that creativity and things like that, I'm also getting real fulfillment out of that bigger picture stuff and having that influence on a different level. And that's, that doesn't have to be the same for everyone. You know, it could be that you really enjoy the graphic design side. So then go learn about that and get really into that and study other people. I just think you can find ways to be fulfilled and it may not be the ways that you're expecting. Yeah, no, I think that's true. Because I know um, something we I, I'll always say or what other people will is they always feel this pressure that my job has to be my career has to be like the thing that I love the most that I'm the most passionate about, like it has to f- check all of my boxes um, in order for me to do it. And the worry of well, what if I'm just I don't like I love parts of it, but not all of it. It feels like a job because you always hear the phrase, oh, do the kind of job that doesn't feel like a job. Um and so even like, even though like even on my end, like running in busy youth, like there are big elements of it that are, you know, filing taxes and going through financials and, you know, I'm not fond of social media. So like doing that, like aren't the things that when I wanted to go into philanthropy that I was like, oh, I'm going to love learning how to do an Instagram story. Like that was not on top of mind when I built Invisi Youth, but they like all come into it. So you have to, like you said, the parts of your job or the lane that you're going and that you enjoy the most, like enjoy those. And then just know the other parts kind of come along with it. I had, this is like a very odd comparison, but um, the, the, k-pop group bts there was a there's a member in the group um the eldest member jin they he had said well i have no hobbies when they had asked him well what do you do outside of being a singer and in this group he's like well i have no hobbies because i have a career that is also a hobby so i don't need to to now find all this extra time elsewhere i got the two in one. But if I had a different job, I would make sure I had a hobby outside of my job that I love so that I would get my job done and feel fulfilled that I'm employing myself and I'm going through and getting and being sustainable for me. But then I have my hobby outside that gives me all of that, like all the feels and the excitement outside of it. So, but I have my two in one, so I don't need hobbies elsewhere. And it always like stuck with me going, that's so true because it takes the pressure off of, I have to find a career, and especially with an illness or disability, you have so much pressure on top of you anyway of, oh, I need to make it accessible to me. I need to make sure my health doesn't get impacted, but I also want to like what I do and not have something else on my plate that I don't really enjoy because- there's parts of having a chronic illness and disability that aren't enjoyable. <laughs> and Allie's like, you. Um, so I think, like you said, reframing, like I don't have to enjoy everything, but I can find real deep fulfillment in parts of it and then find kind of that other things that I enjoy elsewhere. And that brings my balance. Yeah, absolutely. And even like when you think about it, I've seen so many things saying that you know, sometimes when you have a job that you're not as emotionally invested in, that actually opens your brain up for other things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it's something that you can do without, you know, giving too much thought into, you might be able to 
you know, create these wonderful scenarios in your head or think about things or listen to a podcast, you know, I think we get, we get so focused on work as, as a society, we really do like, and I think it's great because I think a lot of us can find fulfillment in that and can find confidence and can do something we love. But like you said, we don't all have to. We don't all have to. I'm not going to be the next Bill Gates. I'm sure he <laughs> loves his job. Like, I like my job, but we don't all have to be this level. We can all just go along, enjoy what we want to enjoy, take from it what we want. If you want to make your job, you know, your career, your a real part of your persona, part of your identity, great. If you think, actually, that doesn't quite align with my identity, it's not important to me. I want to do that but I want to focus my attention on my hobbies or what I like to do or the people I love like that's fine I think we sometimes get so focused on well what do you do and actually it's like it's not what do you do it's how do you spend your time what makes you happy like these are the important questions as well yeah like I love my job so I'm very happy to talk about it but I think just taking that pressure off also and realizing you know there's times where I haven't loved my jobs you're seeing a great side of it now. Um, but I think it's important to remember that even I've had, you know, ups and downs. And if you're in a place where you're at a bit of a down at the moment, that's okay. Like an up is probably coming. Yeah, definitely. I love, it's a great way to end the podcast. An up is probably coming. You can always, you can always go up from there. I like how you phrase that too. That's a really good point for people to, to take away from when they're trying to reframe careers or figure out, you know, I think I want to add another hobby. So I have something fun that I can do just for me outside of it. Um, and like get that enjoyment elsewhere. Like you said, I think it's important for people to know like all scopes of as long as you're feeling fulfilled overall in life, it doesn't matter where that comes from, as long as you kind of get that end goal from it. And so I think that's really, that's a really sound piece of advice to end the episode on, Allie. And I can't, I cannot believe we are ending the podcast episode. I had so much fun getting to chat with you on the podcast, but I want to make sure everybody else can find you on social media. So where can all of our listeners and viewers be able to connect with you? Yes, I would love to connect with everyone. The best place to find me is Instagram. It's at Ali Hemsley. I'll be honest, I've been taking a little bit of social media break, but you can still find me on there and check out loads of years worth of content. So there'll be plenty to keep you occupied. Absolutely. And Ali has phenomenal photography up there of herself. And obviously you'll get to see lovely photos of beautiful Piper and her husband and all of her and and, and a football photo or two, I can guarantee will be there as well. Um, So I'm, like I said, I'm so happy Happy to have had you back on the podcast and I will make sure your Instagram is linked below and as always you can find Invisi Youth on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and YouTube at Invisi Youth and you can find the Invisi Youth chat sessions on YouTube or on all of our audio podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify so make sure you click that link to subscribe you leave five stars or a thumbs up you write a positive review or a note on the episode we would thoroughly appreciate it it definitely helps us so much um, boost us in that algorithm if you will so we really appreciate that so much Ali thanks for hanging out with me you know us all you know not on WhatsApp and all dressed up I appreciate it and I had so much fun with you thank you so much for having me Oh my God, guys. All right. I will get to check in with all of you later on our next podcast episode, and I will speak with all of you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.